Uh, Shaun of the Sheep uh, movie is uh, the movie of the moment here, and we're going to talk about it now. Uh, and with us to help us do that, uh, the dynamic duo of Richard Golly Starzak and Mark Burton, co-writers and directors of Shaun of the Sheep movie. Um, uh, I, keep want, I keep wanting to say Sh- Shaun of the Sheep. Yeah, Shaun of the Sheep is, uh, I think you're thinking of Shaun of the Dead, which is uh, yeah, I a think so. movie. Yeah, that's I, a zombie I, movie, that's very different. I was just going to say, what is that anyway? But anyway... Uh, um, <laughs> uh, Richard Starzak uh, joined uh, Arvin Studios in 1983. During that uh, first nine years with the studio, he's credited with working on Morph, Sledgehammer for Peter Gabriel, uh, Pee Wee Herman's uh, Playhouse in New York, his own film Ident, and two uh, Rex the Runt pilot films. Mark Burton was a writer on both uh, Chicken Run and Wallace and Gromit, uh, Curse of the uh, Were Rabbit, which won the Oscar in 2005 for Best Animated Feature. And anyway, here they are. Gentlemen, how goes it? You're good? Yeah, we're fine. Thanks for being here. Yeah, okay. Thanks. I really, I, you know, I, I really struggle to come up with like a description of, of, of what this movie is about, and, and nothing really does it justice. It's sort of like, it's like uneventful in its eventfulness, or, or <laughs> eventful in its uneventfulness. Uh, uh, but it, you know what it reminded me of? Seriously, I, I just, I saw this recently. Liza Minnelli was talking about Meet Me in St. Louis, and she was talking about her father, Vincent Minnelli, when he was pitching that movie to Louis B. Mayer. And he said, well, what's it about? And he says, well, it's about this family that lives in St. Louis that's told one day by their father that they have to move. Mm-hmm. My point being, it's, uh, the, it's the manner in which the story is told, really, in the end, that determines its effectiveness and its status. Which leads me to my first question here. Uh, uh, lead animator, uh, Will Betcher, he said, uh, uh, dialogue, about dialogue, he said it's such an important element for animators because, because it adds a certain level of performance for the characters. Can you guys talk about how you achieved character here in Shaun the Sheep movie strictly through the visual and the sound design? It's amazing. This is, yeah. this is one of the most cinematic movies I've seen in ages. Purely, purely cinematic. Well, well thank you. That's what we set out to achieve. And uh, I think we both... Um, the, the, the Shaun the Sheep series didn't have any dialogue we were, and, and were quite cinematic in their own right. And I think that's... Uh, we learned a lot doing that. But uh, that was the, the goal and the aim was to do uh, make a cinematic movie. And as they say, you, you know, you can watch the, the best films you can watch with the sound turned down. And um, that, that's what we, we aimed for, was, yeah. was a cinematic movie. Yeah, but, and, but it's also an 85-minute feature film, too. Yeah. That's, uh, we should point that out as well. And it's pretty much sustained. It is. It's sustained all the way through. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's worth saying that, um, you know, there's... There's, there is communication in the movie, there's non-verbal communication if you like, and one thing that we were very um, rigorous about was that you always know what's going on in the characters' heads, and I think after a while, I mean we were, we were concerned ourselves at the beginning, you know, is this process going to work, is it, are kids going to stay with it and everything, and then we realised that what happens is, if you know what everyone's thinking, uh, you, you know what's going on in their heads, then the, the need for dialogue kind of goes away after a while, you don't think about it, because that's... It's just another way of communicating. We have other. We use, you know, gestures and. I, that's a really good point. I suspect if I hadn't gone into this movie knowing that there wasn't going to be any dialogue, I might not have even noticed it. Maybe until about an hour into the movie. Seriously, yeah. that's how that's how caught up you get. That's interesting. Yeah, we've had a lot of feedback like that. I said I I didn't notice that there wasn't any dialogue. Uh, that, that's the, uh, that's really, I guess that's, that's the really ultimate compliment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, 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 there's so many wonderful set pieces in this movie, and, and without giving too much away, I, the, the sheep at some point are, are disguised as humans, and they score these reservations at this fancy restaurant. It's called the Le, Le, Le Chow Brut, which, which is translated as... Oh, Brute. Oh, Brute. Choux which Brule. Which, which, the, uh, which is what? It's either the cabbage. raw cabbage or the burnt cabbage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, burnt cabbage, right? Yeah, the yeah. French love that gag, yeah. What 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 show? <laughs> what well, Chopin is, is is being played in the background. The the, the grand waltz, brilliant. Did did you, did you guys choose that? I I don't know why, but that particular piece of music played in the background was the funniest thing about that scene for me. <laughs> aside from the insanity and ridiculousness yeah, yeah. of the concert. I think that's why, because I think it's all about some um, light and shade, and there's a very noisy and quite contemporary piece of music that leads up to it. <laughs> And um, uh, you, you, you and, and it creates that um, that piece of music was so good because there's a tension. There's a kind of comedy of manners we call it. You know, there's a tension. So, yeah. The tension in the restaurant. It's very posh. No one's allowed to you know speak very loud. Everyone's whispering and all that. And then at the same time, that music's got a kind of energy to it. You know, which is um, we, we tried many different kinds of music because sometimes we we started off with some sort of lounge jazz. But yeah. it was just, the energy was no, too low. Perfect. You know, you needed that kind of um, highly strung music if you like. 
just can imagine sort of 18th century people <laughs> sat in the parlor listening to that playing on the Totally, I think that's why I found it so funny yeah. because of what was going on in, 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 in the scene. But how did how did they man? I, I, I was curious how they managed to score reservations in such a frou frou place. I mean, <laughs> looking the way they did. That that's the other thing that was going through my head during that whole scene. How the hell? What the? How did they? Anyway, there must be a recession going on in that particular city. There must be. Yeah. Uh, and we can we say what the menu menu was? Maybe we should keep that as a surprise. Uh, Literally, what the menu was. Oh yeah, maybe that's the gag about it. Yeah, we yeah. we'll, we'll keep that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you guys also captured animal shelters, I think, really well, and um, it's funny because I used to think that too. Going going through animal shelters, I'm thinking, oh, they're they're all they're all going to be putting on their best, or they're they're either or they're going to play sad, or they're going to play yeah. forlorn in order to be selected. And yeah, obviously, yeah. I wasn't the first to, to think about that. It's beautifully uh, dramatized oh, thank here. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, we're talking to Richard Golly Starzak and uh, Mark Burton, uh, co-writers and directors of uh, Shaun the Sheep, um, and and the the daunting statistics that go behind the making of something like this. God, what 197 sheep puppets? Shaun was had 21, 157 human figures, 80,000 storyboards, sp- uh, storyboards, uh, 58 cameras. Epic. Mm-hmm. I mean, epic. What? Uh, uh, two and a half minutes worth of footage. What if you were lucky in a week? Yeah, that that, that sounds incredibly slow. But in in, in fact, um, the previous film Pirates that we made had uh, twice as many crew, twice as much time. I suppose. Yeah, uh, I suppose. So so actually, for, it was it was as close to an adrenaline rush as as you get. <laughs> and the really yeah, uh, we're just used to working like that. You know the the. Two and a half seconds a day is probably twice as fast as some of our other films have been. So uh, to get two and a half minutes at the end of the week seems like a huge amount to me. It's probably funny. You. It's yeah. funny you said ad- adrenaline, adrenaline rush because I think one of the, 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 the beautiful things about this movie is that it is, it is, it, it's very gentle and it's very delicate and it's very subtle and it's very very sweet and and, and by sweet I, I mean anything but cloying or, or treacly it's warm, just I think it's yeah, warm. yeah yeah no it's just it's really intrinsically um, poignant I guess um, so you said adrenaline rush I just thought that was a weird weird <laughs> joke <laughs> well I, mean, I think what, yeah, to be fair I mean uh, the actual process of making something like this um, is, is logistically a huge um, you know uh, process and so every in fact our time even though it's a slow very slow burn every minute of our time as directors is, is already kind of preordained yeah yeah. We're rushing around trying to get everything yeah. done. So. I, guess, I, guess, I guess it would have to be right. For it was it was twelve hour day, six days a week for a long time for us. Yeah. Dedicated professionals, you guys. Um, uh, some some of the sets in the movie appeared quite large. Is that kind of standard now? Were the were the, were the sets actually lar- large? Large. Yeah, I mean large in the sense that uh, bigger than you would think. You mean you mean in terms of human scale, in terms of what they actually were physically made? Well, yeah, f- well both. Both. Okay. Um, well, I think with the idea was when the, oh, sorry, yeah, when, the, when, the, when the flock were in the city, uh, we wanted them to feel kind of uh, intimidated by it. So we shot it to make everything look, uh, look quite claustrophobic around them and big uh, and uncomfortable for them. So that was that was an intentional part of the storytelling thing. Mark, you said that um, you related to the farmer. Yeah. Well, anybody who's a bald, grumpy, middle-aged man, I can't think why. <laughs> that, that's that, that's why. Right. That's it, right? Is that what are you saying? Yeah. Actually, no, are I, you I, saying I, you're a bald, grumpy, <laughs> middle-aged man? No, but actually, I, I also think he. he, he uh, and we always. It's funny. Me and Richard, uh, when we were doing the, you know, working on the story, we were drawn to the farmer and his little story, you know, because um, there, there is a poignancy to it, you know, that he's. Um, mm-hmm. That he, in a way, there's if there is a sort of thematic idea in the story, it's about learning to appreciate the people in our lives, people we love, we sometimes take for granted. And I think he kind of needs to learn that as well. So um, there's a little little thing going on there. Yeah, it's like every, everyone in the, in the movie's lost their way and they, they kind of come together again. And, and, and Richard, Peter Lord described your sensibility as punk uh, and, and your sense of humour as sardonic, derived uh, from, your, from your Polish ancestry. That's uh, a, apparently a quote yeah. attributed to him. Yeah. Well, uh, I, 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 if I saw you on the street, I would... That's the last thing I would no. think. But I, I was a punk. I mean, I, I did um, in the early days. I, I was kind of um, 
Uh, I worked. Out, I had a show called Rex the Runt, right. which was uh, was kind of very punky in relation to what Wallace and Gromit. So, yeah, maybe my uh, humour is a bit more sardonic. Yeah, possibly. Um, the Sean, Sean the Sheep absolutely maintains the Ardman style. In fact, it feels slightly closer to earlier. I think Wallace and Gromit films or or the Creature Comfort shorts. Can can either of you comment on that, or is that just my perception? Well, I, possibly. I mean, I, I worked um, on Creature Comforts, and there, there is a link that, despite Creature Comforts being all about dialogue uh, and Sean being all about non-dialogue, there is a link there. Is that in Creature Comforts we discovered um, a kind of shortcut to method acting with the characters because we we wanted to get into the more depth with uh, in Creature Comforts the TV series and have characters. Uh, if they if they said something, you might perceive that they're lying, or you might perceive that there's something underneath what they're saying that's not actually coming out. So we did a lot of research into uh, how uh, method actors use their eyes and uh, acting with the eyes, which was we then transposed into into Sean because it was more important than Sean because there wasn't any dialogue. So there is a link there. George Cukor said, I think he said that uh, in movies he said eighty percent of the of the of, of acting is done with the eyes. So yeah. it just made me think of that. If I get a bit nerdy for a second, it's, uh, yeah, we looked into the, 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 your, uh, there's a thing you can find on the internet called eye accessing cues, um, which is part of uh, neuro-linguistic programming uh, un understanding. And it, it, it just simply means that um, it's a universal language for where our eyes move to, to access different parts of our brain. So if we look up, we access things visually. If we look down, we access things um, uh, that uh, kind of more conceptual. And there, there, there are lots of subtle variations, so we, we use those. Uh, in it does make me wonder, though, if 80% of acting is in the eye, does that make flies the best actors? <laughs> They've got like six eyes or something. I mean, that would be, be great to have a fly movie. That would be... In terms of re logic, I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> You'd have to conclude that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, um, Bitzer the dog in this movie, he falls prey to, I think, what's the canine equivalent to crack for humans, um, a bone. Uh, without giving away too much of this scene, how do, you how do you guys set out and write a scene like that? Which is so, <laughs> so when, when you just contemplate it, it's so, it's so insane, you, you start laughing. But to actually see it unfold, and um, how, how do you, what do you, what do you do? Just sit in a room, toss around ideas? Well, uh, yeah. That's an interesting one because there's a, there's a number of factors. I think we had the idea fairly early on. I mean, we laughed and we said that would be great fun and everything. And then actually the devil's in the detail. We spent a long time working on that sequence because there's, there's two very important things. One is that um, you bring the audience with you into that set piece, that they believe it could happen and they, and they, and they understand why it happens. Well, if you just told that to me, I'd say that there's no way it can happen. Watching it yeah. in the movie, you're thinking, oh my God, this you is actually of, getting yeah. scary now. Yeah. You know, what's happening? I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you but have you're to You're kind of with a character. And yeah, I think right. The second thing as well is that you want to explore the idea. So you, know, you're saying, you get him in that situation, and then, um, and then you kind of you try and milk as much comedy from it as you can, and then, and then kind of get out of it um, yeah, at the right point. So actually, that, 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 it, took a, it took a long time. You know, we were. You did work very hard on it, but um, I think in the end it kind of works out pretty well. Uh, yeah, I think I should say just for context, the scene is Bitzer the dog winds up in an operating room, and he's he's in full uh, operating. He's doctor disguised operating, as a surgeon. A surgeon, and and everybody just assumes he's supposed to be there, and, and he's he's about to. It's a kind of idea. There's something very there's something that <laughs> yeah. the psychology of you know that thing where we all have that fear of being put in situations that we can't. You know, the imposter syndrome they call it. Well, um, not, and not and not only that, it made you really think about. Uh, Operations too. I mean, there was just that shot of the stomach, and I'm thinking he's going to rip that stomach open. I'm thinking, no, this is this is like, <laughs> no, that true. that would be like the tone of that. But I actually was like thinking, don't don't do don't go there. Like, I, yeah, you know, yeah. But it, it was great. It was it was just a great scene. Um, yeah. it, it, and how I mean, get your guys' thoughts on this? How's the craft of um, stop motion animation changed for Artman Studios in, in, in its 40 year history? You know, I know you guys. I know they've used digital stuff assistance in recent years. Um, are, are any of the effects in, in Sean uh, digital? I know a lot looks like real water in there. You know, I don't know. Yes, well, I think um, we we set out to do as much in camera as we possibly could. That's mm -hmm. the that's the fun of doing stop frame. It's a lot of problem solving. How do we do this splash? How do we do this skid? How do we do this crash? 
so um, we love doing that. that that's the fun of it uh, do as much in camera as possible there, odd occasion we just wanted um, water to look more like water because we uh, and we used a bit of CGI in, I think in two places just just small little little sections one of a splash and one of a bit of rain um, but and but generally we we, uh, we love that problem solving at the end of the film when the farmer spits out his tea I don't know if you remember that yes either. I do yeah that, that spit was actually um, uh, the uh, the fiber optics from one of those lamps you know the, the, the one of those lamps where all the ends of the fiber optics line yes, up right they, yeah. we, did, we just got a cheap lamp pulled them out and stuck them in the farmer's oh. mouth and it looked like a freeze frame of a is that when you? I mean, Mark, you mentioned that the, you know everything is like carefully planned out, and you kind of know what you're going to do. do. Do you ever get when you're you know in the physical act of working on these things on the set? Do you ever get like like a ju like juiced like like wow, you know? Or, or or do I do I additional ideas come to you that maybe you can incorporate? I mean, I because I get the impression a lot of times making these types of films is just it's kind of rigorous. You know, this is on the schedule. We got to get this done, and so and, and in some respects, that sounds like factory work to well, me. Well, we it, it, it does, um, I mean, we build that process in. So yeah, there's a lot of room in the process okay. for for us to find those. You know, find the funny if you want to call it that. Or, um, but there's a point at which you've got to stop doing that, and you've got to make the film. But I mean, um, me and Richard would do um, this process, which a lot of animation um, companies do, which is called live action video, which is where we would actually act out with the animator, act out the shot or act out the scene. And the idea there being that by going through the process of doing it, you sometimes would a look in your face or something would just emerge that the animator could use. And also would give you a sense of the beats of the shot and what, okay. it, what the shot was about. So yeah, and we would, you know, we, we would, um, we spent a lot of time, you know, they say the art of writing is rewriting and we would spend a lot of time working on all the comedy and, and retrying stuff and changing the timing of it. And it really only stopped when we got to the, um, the actual animation but even then sometimes we would we would have to do it again if it wasn't right and there were a couple of times when we changed shots after they'd been animated because uh, the farmer um, takes a blow to the head the final end credit is is a link to the website head headway .org headway, yeah. uk seriously yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, Mark's, uh, Mark, Mark can tell you about that. He's, uh... Well, it's interesting. Is it? Maybe it's a, there's a generational thing but I mean the... the um, Head injury for a lot of people now isn't funny. So it was kind of like something that we we would um, we were and we wanted to have that storyline. I mean, it's a slapstick storyline, but at the same time, um, it, just for me personally, because I was working at this charity as part of my own sort of personal life, and um, uh, and it had a head head injury charity, I kind of felt this slight guilt. So I thought, well, actually, it's a good thing we can actually have fun and and do it. So it is. Do. See, it's funny. I, I thought. I just assumed it was a joke, and I didn't even go to. I didn't even like look at the website. I probably oh, wouldn't no, no, even ask that question. It's absolutely that. real. In fact, we had a charity screening for that website. They were delighted. You know, we approached them and said, "Look, we've got this storyline. We're gonna, we, we, you know, we, we, it is a slapstick storyline, but we there's a sensitive element to it, and, um, and that's how we kind of wanted to deal with it. So, I mean, I think you you can go too far, and you can end up sort of, you know, not being funny about anything. But I think we we found the right balance there. Yeah, yeah for think, sure. Yeah. I think there's a kind of comedy paradox. Is we're trying to make a slapstick film, and slapstick is kind of based on laughing at other people's pain. So to, to have them in pain but not not really hurt is you know is, is the paradox. So yeah, look at the uh, three Stooges, right? You yeah. just wonder how they uh, get yeah. through the like. Now you can do, yeah, yeah, have helmets on the whole Yeah, time. right. I'm yeah. not sure if the <laughs> same, true, the same is true here, but you know we have our uh, you know Tom and Jerry cartoons uh, uh, censored now. You know, there's, there's some of those uh, j jokes just aren't allowed. Yeah, well, some of the Tom, yeah, some of the Tom and Jerry stuff is really it, it doesn't even seem funny to me now right. uh, because they're actually screaming in pain. <laughs> you know, like whereas like the Three Stooges, it's so it's so yeah, like, yeah. heightened and and, yeah. and the sound yeah. effects are ridiculous. Yeah. So you laugh, yeah. but yeah, yeah okay. Uh, I guess that's as good a way to to end this here. Uh, uh, Sean the Sheet movie, it's um, it's terrific. Uh, we've been in conversation with the writer directors Mark Burton uh, and Richard Starzak. Um, uh, I, I, okay, I'm going to do this with a sh uh, straight face here. Sean the Sheep and off the off the bar. Uh, master fleece that y you will love, whoever you are. <laughs> you get paid by the pun or something. Else, right. So. And, uh, oh, here we go. And Abbott and Costello would love this movie. Mutt and Jeff would too. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, uh, check it out. Thank you guys Thanks for being lot. here. Thank it was great. Thank, Thank you. you.